Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk about ghosts, spirits, and mythological creatures. From a scientific standpoint, these things kinda don't exist. There simply isn't evidence for them that doesn't require a bit of suspension of disbelief. But from a cultural and historical perspective, creatures like the Black Dog, the Dullahan, the Wendigo, and things like banshees and sirens, so many, many more that naming all of them would take forever, these beings can come about in stories and folklore for a great many reasons. The Dullahan, for example, also known as the Headless Horseman, can be viewed as the manifestation of a Celtic god, and in other cases as the vengeful spirit of a deceased soldier looking for his head. Something like the Wendigo, originating from native tribes as a story, a human-eating monster, can simply be viewed as a warning against cannibalism, and as a scary story to keep kids in line and out of the woods, or perhaps as a story that condemns greed and gluttony and promotes togetherness. I could go on and on, picking through different folklores and the like, but what I want to focus on right now is more the names of the creatures themselves. While originally associated with their own respective folktales, the historical relevance and the words being often associated with violent otherworldly beings, this seems to make the names of these creatures rather enticing in a sense. Like they just end up sounding cooler for lack of a better word. For example, call something a fairy woman, that doesn't sound very cool, but a banshee, now that sounds really cool. Put simply, the names of these creatures are more impactful and attention-grabbing. Now, why mention this? Well, because back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the aircraft company McDonnell seemed to really like these more impactful names, that these folklore-adjacent creatures had, and used them for most of their projects in that span, with planes being called the Phantom, the Goblin, Voodoo, Demon, Phantom 2, Banshee, and also Little Henry and Whirlaway, breaking the naming convention for some reason. Regardless, though, we're talking about one of these planes, which was actually kind of unique in that it was the only jet fighter ever in the Royal Canadian Navy, and also represented the sort of end of an era for military fighters and jet fighters. This is the wonderfully named McDonnell F-2H Banshee. The story here starts out with a different plane, the McDonnell F-H Phantom. Back in 1943, the U.S. Navy wanted to begin looking into these new jet engines that everyone was talking about, but they had a little bit of a problem. They were in the middle of World War II, and all other major companies were preoccupied with the production and design of more conventional piston engine fighters, so there was some amount of hesitance in asking one of them to embark on this experimental journey. Luckily for the Navy, though, the company McDonnell Aircraft, founded just four years prior by James Smith McDonnell, was available for experimental work, as they had no other production contracts and were only really working on the XP-67 Moonbat Interceptor project. Even though McDonnell had only made or had been working on this one specific plane, that fact may have actually helped them and made them the most optimal company for making a new innovative jet fighter, because the company basically had no prior design history, and effectively no design philosophy to adhere to, and nothing to bind them, the Navy believed that this made them better suited for making a new experimental radical design. So on August 30th, 1943, the U.S. Navy requested from McDonnell that they design a carrier-based jet fighter. As far as I could find, there weren't any specifications other than it being a carrier-based jet fighter, and that the company Westinghouse Electric Corporation be part of the jet engine design process. 
Other than that, it seems as though anything they came up with was fair game. With this lack of restrictions, this led McDonnell to initially design a plane that actually had six jet engines on it, three 300-foot-pound jet thrusters in each wing, so a total of 1,800 foot-pounds of thrust. However, this idea was quickly quashed after initial testing and examination led them to conclude that two jet engines, each with around 1,100 foot-pounds of thrust, located in the wing roots right at the fuselage, was the most optimal design. This general layout, the two engines in the wing roots, along with wings that had a quasi-forward-swept appearance, would be the basis of the FH Phantom design. Measuring in at 11.35 meters long, 12.42 meters wide, and 4.32 meters tall, weighing 10,035 pounds gross, armed with four 50 caliber machine guns, the Phantom was relatively lightly armed for a U.S. fighter aircraft made in the Second World War, but since the main focus was making a jet fighter, the armament wasn't terribly important at the moment. When the design flew for the first time on January 26, 1945, the performance was actually pretty solid, especially for something that was more experimental and unconventional, and from a company with such little experience. With the jet engines, the main goal would be speed, and the Phantom would manage a top speed at sea level of 479 miles an hour, and up to 505 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. That top speed made it the first Navy aircraft to go above 500 miles an hour in level flight. Still though, this kind of performance wasn't all that great, all things considered. Sure, it did hit 500 miles an hour, but compare it to other carrier-based fighters from 1945, and that speed boost was offset by a significant decrease in range and armament. More conventional fighters had bomb-carrying capacity, and the Phantom did not. Also, the fighters typically had six 50 caliber machine guns, so they were stronger in that aspect too, with the Phantom having a range of 690 miles, that was a good deal less than planes like the F-6F Hellcat and late war F-4U Corsairs, probably at least partially because of the comparative performance, but also more likely because World War II would come to an end that year, the initial order for 100 Phantoms, placed on March 7, 1945, was reduced to just 60. While the Phantom would end up being the first jet fighter flown from a carrier, and it would be adopted in 1947, its career was incredibly short due to its comparatively lackluster performance, and it was retired from active duty in 1949 but it being the first carrier-based jet fighter flown and performing capably enough, the U.S. Navy was interested in improving upon the design, even before the Phantom was adopted, even before the order for 100 of them was ever placed. Indeed, working off the initial performance of the prototype, the Navy requested from McDonnell on March 2, 1945, that new designs for improved jet fighters this time to be fighter bombers be produced. This would be the McDonnell F-2H Banshee. Generally speaking, the design of the Banshee would mimic the Phantom, just being a bit scaled up in several areas. Measuring in at 12.24 meters long, 13.67 meters wide, and 4.42 meters tall, the Banshee was just slightly larger than the Phantom across all three axes. Weight-wise, though, the Banshee was much heavier, sitting at a gross weight of 22,312 pounds, more than double the weight of the Phantom. This significant increase in weight was largely due to the new and improved engines, along with an upgrade in its armament. The original Phantom engine sat at 1,100 foot-pounds of thrust each, 
and by the end of its career that was up to 1,600 pounds. Each Banshee engine, the Westinghouse J34, would double that, sitting at 3,250 foot-pounds of thrust per engine. This coincided, though, with an additional 400 pounds per engine, along with internal strengthening and an overall size increase in the wing roots and fuselage to house the larger and more powerful engines. Additionally, to feed the larger engines, in addition to increasing the range, the internal fuel tanks were increased in size as well. Armament-wise, the four 50 caliber machine guns would be swapped out for four 20mm cannons, specifically the Colt Mark 12 cannon, with 220 rounds for two of the guns and another 250 rounds for the other two. Additionally, there was room for up to 1,000 pounds of explosives to be carried as two 500-pound bombs or as some rockets. And there was also capabilities for it to carry two 200-gallon drop tanks mounted on the wingtips. This increased fuel storage would increase the range upwards of 1,475 miles. This range increase would put it above the late World War II fighters like the Hellcat and Corsair. Also putting the Banshee above the Hellcat and Corsair was its top speed, hitting 532 miles an hour at 10,000 feet, putting it above the Phantom as well. Not significantly above, but above nonetheless. After the first Banshee prototype flew on January 11, 1947, the plane was quickly ordered into production in May that same year with an initial 56 being ordered. These initial versions would lack the wingtip drop tanks, and those would appear on the second model made starting in 1949. The second model, the F2H2, would be the most abundant version built at over 300. After production of the F2H2 concluded in 1952, the next model, the F2H3, would begin featuring improvements that increased the range, top speed, and length. In an effort to increase the range, the fuselage had to be lengthened from 12.24 meters up to 14.68 meters. This increase in internal fuel capacity along with the two wingtip drop tanks increased the range from 1,475 miles to 1,710 miles. Additionally, even though engine power was not improved, the top speed would increase, possibly because of some aerodynamic effect of the lengthened fuselage, and also possibly because they redesigned the tail. The top speed went from 532 miles an hour up to 580 miles an hour. There was also an increase in the potential bomb load from 1,000 to 3,000 pounds. Somehow, too, it's listed that the weight actually dropped from 22,000 pounds to 21,000 pounds. Where exactly they cut weight, I'm not sure. I suspect that might be a bit of a clerical error. Overall, though, the performance of the F2H3 would be the peak of the Banshee. There was a F2H4 model, but the top speed of that one dropped down to 524 miles an hour which corresponded to a weight increase up around 28,000 pounds. All in all, across all fighter variants, along with some smaller run recon and night fighter variants, 895 Banshee aircraft were produced from 1947 to 1953. The bigger question, though, is how the Banshees performed in combat. Being adopted in 1948, they would appear in the Navy arsenal just in time for the Korean War. How would one of the first jet fighters used by the U.S. Navy perform? To sum it up in just one word, or I guess one sound, eh. Well, alright, I mean, to be fair, I guess that's a little harsh. It was good with a few specific roles and not good in others. You know, like every other plane in existence. Built as a fighter, 
there would be two specific roles that the Banshee would perform quite well at, and both of these roles had a common denominator. The first role was as an escort fighter. Recall that on the Banshee, we'll use the F2H2 model, as that was the prominent variant early in the war, the range was quite good as jet fighters were concerned. Early jet fighters often had poor range due to the inherently high fuel consumption that early jet engines suffered from. Newer technology and all that, they have to work out the kinks. For comparison's sake, a plane like the F-9F Panther, another early Navy jet fighter, had a range 175 miles shorter, around 1,300 miles on the most advanced model, the F-9F-5. So, at least for the purpose of escorting, that slight range increase made it the more optimal choice. Making it better than the Panther still was the service ceiling. The same Banshee variant, the F-2H-2, had a service ceiling somewhere in the range of 44,000 to 48,000 feet which was actually a higher service ceiling than the B-29 bombers they would be escorting, but compared to the roughly 42,000-foot service ceiling of the Panther, the Banshee was just a little bit better. Armament-wise, the two planes were basically the same, with four 20mm cannons, but still, as an escort fighter, range was the primary concern, and the service ceiling was also critical and the Banshee had both of these over the Panther. So, in the early stages of the Korean War, those factors considered, the Banshee was effectively the plane of choice for escorting bombers. The Panther would also partake in these missions out of necessity, but the Banshee was considered the more optimal aircraft. In this role as an escort early in the war, the Banshee had quite the easy job it's actually rather difficult to judge its performance in this role, since the early war North Korean Air Force lacked modern fighters of any kind. They were actually using late World War II aircraft, like the Yak-9 and IL-10. Good planes in their time, but terribly outdated now. These kind of planes would struggle to reach the altitudes of the Banshees and the Bombers plus the planes that the North Koreans had were taken out early closer to the ground by other U.S. and Allied fighters, so the Banshee wouldn't have to do much other than avoid anti-aircraft fire. In the same vein as that role, because of the high altitude performance and the lacking North Korean aircraft, the Banshee would also serve quite well as a photo-reconnaissance aircraft. For this role, the thing that made the Banshee better than just about anything else the U.S. had at the moment was the service ceiling and its relatively smaller size. If the Banshee was up around 45,000 feet, its relative maximum, then it would be incredibly difficult to spot it from the ground, near impossible without some kind of magnifying equipment. With the combination of being hard to spot at such altitudes, and the enemy lacking aircraft that could take it down, the Banshee served incredibly well in the early stages of the war, losing just two aircraft to anti-aircraft fire. So, in these two roles, all's well and good. The Banshee didn't really have to fight for several reasons, and its specifications made it optimal for those roles. If we go outside of those roles, though, there is at least potentially a different story. In late 1950 and early 1951, the North Korean forces started receiving modern aircraft, specifically planes like the MiG-15. On paper, this wasn't that big of a deal. The 5,950 foot-pound thrust engine the MiG-15 had was less powerful than the combined power of the Banshee's two engines, and arguably the Banshee had more firepower. At least in these regards, the Banshee was better. However, the MiG-15 had a top speed of 669 miles an hour at sea level, more than 80 miles an hour more than the best Banshee variant. Additionally, the MiG-15 was more agile, 
and thus was overall much better in a one-on-one -on -one fight. But why? The answer is actually pretty simple. It was the wings. This is something I've talked about in other videos, but for a reminder, for high-speed aircraft, swept wings are just better. This is because at higher speeds, wings that are perpendicular to the fuselage have higher drag overall due to the more intense pressure waves experienced at high speeds. Swept wings can help delay this effect, thus giving the plane more wiggle room before it starts experiencing these higher drag effects. There's a lot of science behind this that I'm not equipped to explain, to be perfectly honest, but just know that swept wings are better for higher speeds. So anyway, with the MiG-15 having swept wings, it was able to reach higher speeds than the Banshee or the Panther or the P-80 Shooting Star, which was also prominent in Korea. Military leadership was well aware of the fact that the Banshee could not match the MiG-15 in a one-on-one -on -one fight, so it was kept out of harm's way and would not serve as a low-level fighter. That role was reserved initially for the P-80 and the Panther, both of which were technically inferior to the MiG. The Panther would allegedly perform decently in this role, and the P-82 for that matter, but military leadership clearly saw a problem and wanted to bring more and more F-86 Sabres into the fold, a swept-wing jet fighter. The Sabres were much faster, nearly 100 miles an hour faster than other straight-wing aircraft like the Banshee, and thus it was much more effective against the MiGs, claiming a kill-death ratio of about 10 to 1. Still, though, the very fact that the U.S. military was so keenly aware of the deficiencies of the Banshee against the MiG-15, and the fact that the Banshee was designed to be a fighter, that's what makes me say its overall performance was just eh. The Banshee still managed to stay in service until 1959, though, where it would then be relegated to reserve service until the mid-60s, where it was finally retired outright. The straight wings limited what it could do in the then-modern fighter era. But a bigger question does lie in why the U.S. Navy didn't push for it to be a swept-wing fighter. The general concept for sweeping the wings to improve speed performance was already known when the designing and testing of the Banshee was occurring. So why didn't they? The reason for that is also quite simple, in that swept wings struggle more at low speeds. In a dogfight, this didn't matter as much, but for a fighter taking off from and landing on aircraft carriers, Low speed performance and stability is incredibly important, lest you crash onto the deck or cartwheel into the ocean. So with swept wings having comparatively low poor speed flight performance in terms of lift and in catastrophic cases, the nose can suddenly just pitch up and throw the plane out of whack, a phenomenon known as the saber dance, US military leadership was hesitant to put a swept-wing aircraft on carriers, which is why the Panther and Banshee, two straight-wing aircraft, were on carriers, and the Sabre, a swept-wing aircraft, was part of the Air Force. Now, as one last piece of history on the Banshee, it had the interesting and unique distinction of being the only jet fighter used by the Royal Canadian Navy. Ever, even today, this is still the case. Back in 1951, the Canadian Navy was still using piston-engine Sea Fury fighters and sought to purchase 60 Banshee fighters to replace them. This order would not be approved by the Canadian government until 1953, though, and just 39 of them would be ordered in the end. This purchase of 39 Banshees for $25 million dollars ended up being almost completely pointless for several reasons. One, they wouldn't actually serve in combat for Canada. Two, 12 of them were lost to accidents. And three, there was a shift in Canadian military doctrine that led the Navy to focus more on anti-submarine missions, 
which the Banshee was not equipped to perform. By 1962, the Banshee was pulled from active service in Canada, being viewed as too costly to continue their use and maintenance, thus ending the unique and rather pointless career of the Canadian Banshee fighters. But regardless of the relatively quiet, all things considered, career of the Banshee, I do think its existence marks an important turn in carrier-based fighters and Navy aircraft. It marks the point where the Navy was effectively forced to abandon their older design philosophies of straight-wing fighters and pull themselves into the then-modern age of swept-wing fighters. They kind of had to do it, lest the North Korean fighters run rampant. So they threw up their arms, cast aside their reservations, and said, fine, let's use swept wings. And hey, sometimes you have to be dragged into modernity kicking and screaming. The future is now. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I didn't actually know this before looking it up, but the Banshee originates from Ireland and Scotland and is based off of mourning women, which somehow turned into them being harbingers of death, basically. It's weird how some people being really sad just go through a few filters and like a game of telephone and becomes an evil spirit that signals the arrival of death. It's almost rude in some sense. I think Ireland needs to write an apology letter. Anyway, though, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.